skin and osteonecrosis of femoral head. So why this topic is because we've gone through COVID and we are assuming that there's going to be an epidemic of osteonecrosis of femoral head. So just recapitulating uh, uh, the classification, there are many, but uh, when we are sitting in our outpatient department, probably the Ficat outlet is the easiest and uh, the simplest to fall back on uh, what to do to the patient. And I'll take you through the next uh, few minutes uh, based on these simple things. So is it a very uh, unpredictable disease? Yes, you can say. But are there any objective ways to check on day one uh, whether we can predict? So if you, uh, most of the standard textbooks now have this uh, modified uh, curbal method of assessment of the necrotic area, uh, which is in the mid sagittal and the coronal plane. And if you add them up and if it is less than 190 degree, there is a very low risk of collapse. And if it is more than 240, this is almost 100%. So, uh, if you go for a PubMed search and you put avascular necrosis of hip, the first article which comes in is this one. And of course, uh, because it is Sanjay Agarwala who has worked uh, on this topic for over two and a half decades now. And uh, the good news in literature is that we are still not flooded with post-COVID AVN. The reasons could be the cumulative dose of steroids which patients have taken, which are not probably reach the classical uh, uh, 2000 milligram. However, this case report suggests that post-COVID AVM can happen even uh, with a smaller dose. And another thing which this says is that it can happen earlier than the normal time it takes to happen. If you have to have a post-steroid induced AVM, normally it happens from 8 months to 1 year after exposure to steroids. But this report talks about uh, it can happen within five months. But fingers crossed, uh, we still don't have that epidemic of AVM. There is a buzz in the non-peer-reviewed uh, literature, the great literature, which says that it is happening. You talk to your colleagues, most of them would say that there is an increase in the incidence, but it is all anecdotal. So uh, it can be uh, preserved the hip. Yes, we can and uh, there are various ways of doing it, non-surgical and surgical and uh, the, the, the procedure which stands in the middle is called decompression and most of us know about it. So, uh, let's take uh, one of these at, at a time. So, we are conserving the hip, so it should actually be, uh, should be the non-surgical ways and there are various uh, which need to be done like restricted uh, weight bearing, which is also part of surgical uh, procedures. Various lifestyle modifications like, uh, you know, uh, weight control, uh, restriction of alcohol intake, controlling the diabetes. That is where the pharmacological agents have come in, in which you have uh, lipid lowering drugs, anticoagulants, vasodilators and bisphosphonates. So remember these anticoagulants, these are also given with steroids in COVID. So maybe uh, that's helped out in not uh, having an epidemic of uh, AVM. And then there are various uh, other techniques which don't stand uh, the peer reviewed uh, literature, but uh, they still are there. So this is an excellent uh, recent uh, publication in JVJS American by Sanjay Agarwala team, which talks about non-surgical treatment of avascular necrosis of the hip and uh, they have been using alendronate for the first decade and the next decade they used alendronate with intravenous uh, zoantonic acid and they have shown an excellent survivorship of treatment uh, on medical care for AVN. Obviously they have not included uh, the stage 4 where the arthritis is set in but they have included uh, the stage 3 where there is a collapse and they have had a reasonable success up to around 50% uh, and they say that there could be a salvage uh, 
and they are very uh, hopeful in this new regimen where they use oral alendronate and IV zoledronic acid for three years and definitely the advantage of this is uh, earlier relief of pain and improvement of HADASIP score. This was the downside for the only alendronate group in which it took around three months for the pain to disappear and the meantime the patient compliance would disappear. Having treatment but no relief, so he would be pulled into a surgical group. Anticoagulants, uh, anoxoparin has been used uh, quite a lot for EVN and it uh, is supposed to be having a role, uh, especially when uh, it is in conjunction with other uh, conserving modalities. So, cold decompression, uh, as I have told you, is the one treatment which stands for stage 1, 2 and also there is some proof for stage 3. And there are various ways of core decompression. We started with large bores and classically putting in fibrillae, trying to direct them towards the AVM area. But we've now stabilized to a procedure in which we use a 3, 3.2 or 3.5 and drill bit and do multiple drill holes using just one entry point and directing them in various direction. The AMR2 to decompress an area which is which has a high pressure and the drilling process itself brings in vascularity and helps healing. The same drilling as you can see on the left side, you can also go through the neck head junction that is invariably done when you do an additive procedure in which you are exposing the hip. We will come to it later no, down. So the efficacy and safety of core decompression for treatment of femoral necrosis. Now this is a systematic review of uh, 2021 and I am going to share with you systematic reviews only of the last three years. Most of them are 2020 and 2021. And uh, they say that core de decompression is an effective and safe method of treatment. Look at the red line. High quality randomized controlled trials and prospective studies will be necessary to clarify the effects of different etiology factors and treatments in this condition. So there is huge amount of literature but then even then level 1 evidence is still missing. Until then the surgeons can choose core decompression to treat uh, osteonecrosis depending upon the patient's condition. And then the efficacy of various core decompression techniques versus non-operative. It concludes that core decompression with cell, ther cell therapy showed a relative superior result in radiographic progression as well as uh, you know pain relief. And then this uh, systematic review which talks about core decompression with bone marrow aspirate concentrate in post collapse. Now, this, the main area of confusion is the orthobiologics, which one to be given, which way it should be given and is it actually efficacious or the core decompression is doing the job. The problem with all orthobiologics is availability, cost and whether actually you are using the right component which you plan to use, meaning the concentration, the way it has been made and various other factors. So this is one uh, systematic review from uh, PGI and uh, Hinduja team which they have said that uh, core decompression with BMAT works more efficiently. Problem with all orthobiologics is you will not get a negative report. Uh, maybe because these orthobiologics cannot be used alone. They have to be an adjunct to whatever procedure you are doing so you don't know what is being, uh, what is helping the patient. However, uh, uh, it's a good direction for research on helping out uh, to prevent uh, the serious uh, end result which could be a total hip replacement. PRP again uh, in adjunction or with either any of the ways of core decompression uh, would be helpful. And same is true with the stem cells. People are now uh, working on what should be the concentration of the cells. And there is this systematic review which says that it should be 10 to the power 8. And they say under 40, anything which helps uh, should be used. And this tantalum rod came with a big buzz around 5 years from now. Uh, and it went up like any other procedure, went through a plateau and it's now actually phasing out because we really don't know whether it works and uh, in the cases where it had to be converted to a total hip, 
the amount of metallosis was huge and incorporation of the the rods were very very poor so coal uh, does prior coal decomposition have detrimental effect on subsequent total hip replacement this is another thing which the total hip replacement uh, stalwarts keep pushing you that please don't uh, do this because your outcomes are going to be bad but then for coal decompression there is a uh, literature now this is actually a systematic review which says that it doesn't affect it is only about coal decompression not other procedures and fibular graft which was in the indian subcontinent for ages and it has gradually moved away uh, for uh, reasons probably because it probably is not adding a value and probably we have moved from the large coal decompressions to multiple small drill holes and the literature has evidence in uh, stage 2a uh, where it is a pre collapse and you want to prevent the collapse again uh, you have various type of iliac crest uh, vascularized pedicle uh, bone grafts which uh, help in increasing the vascularity and when you are doing the procedure you are actually also decompressing so again whether it is a core decompression we really don't know or whether it is a adjunct or both of them have an excellent uh, outcome together tensor fascial lata graft uh, was very popularized from the indian subcontinent also it's a easy graft to take and it is in line with the approach which you need to expose the hip joint but it goes anterior so if there is a surgeon who is an anterior hip joint uh, total hip surgeon he would say don't spoil a my area another technique uh, which uh, we recently published from our institute is the rectus femoris uh, uh, muscle pedicle graft it uses the anterior inferior iliac crest spine so it's a very very simple procedure and it again lies in the line of the exposure of the anterior so anterior muscle pedicle grafts are great grafts especially with those people who do total hip from the posterior side so your posterior side is absolutely virgin when you do your total hip replacements and then there are grafts on the back side the myers is the most popular and the most published for avascular necrosis and this is a great graph for the people who go from the anterior side or the lateral side so they have their anterior side totally virgin when they're going to do a total hip replacement again if you see the colorful picture on the last we've done this modification in our institute where we don't cut the rotators we use a spare technique in which we just retract the rotators proximally and we make a crucial incision in the uh, in the capsule and put the pedicle over there so this uh, probably enhances uh, the outcomes because we are now, we are doing uh, less of damage by uh, cutting the rotators and the last two slides the trap door procedure which is a very popular procedure especially in the textbooks it was a difficult procedures to do in the past but now that the technique of surgical dislocation of hip is uh, stabilized it is a doable procedure and the good part of avian is that the cartilage is okay the subchondral bone is gone so if you can dislocate the hip curate the dead bone pack it up with iliac crest and close it down and we have very nice uh, suturing possibilities now available for cartilage so this could be a, a good uh, procedure to do but it has to be done in um, hands who have the experience of surgical dislocation of the hip the last osteotomies uh, which uh, did play a role they still have a role but they're going out because they are actually indicated when you already missed the bus probably it's probably the stage uh, 2b where there is a collapse or it's a uh, stage 3 uh, where there is a clear cut collapse and you're trying to offload the area and uh, the osteotomy in itself increases the vascularity of the proximal femur, uh, femur by around 200 times so you're hoping that there would be revascularization but most of the osteotomies bring in an implant and they also change the anatomy of the proximal femur both of these are detrimental if this procedure fails and we are already doing it in a in a stage where it is uh, shouting at you that probably we missed the bus the sigoka osteotomy which is a rotational one is a very very successful osteotomy in the popularizing surgeon but it has not been picked up by most of the others so if i have to conclude uh, on hip preservation 
cardiovascular necrosis of the hip. I think uh, there is a huge role. And uh, if you look at Sanjay Agarwala's paper uh, in uh, stage 1, 2 and 3, there is a survivorship of around uh, between 75 to 80 percent and that's a huge uh, percentage and core decompression is going to be the mainstay of treatment uh, even now and age is an issue we are facing uh, patients who are 18 16 20 and that tilts the whole treatment process towards uh, salvage uh, sort of a procedure so we we need to sort of uh, look at those procedures and once there is a stage 3, the collapse has already occurred, you need to be very rational about uh, taking a call on what should be done to that patient. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mani, for the marvelous talk on today, which is uh,